Okay, welcome back to Christian Bible Chapel. This is our evening service, and we thank the Lord for our morning service this morning. Uh, starting at 9 o'clock, we dealt with the pre-K and kindergarten to the uh, third, fourth graders, and then we dealt with the pre-teens and the teenagers at 9.30 and the adult class at 10 o'clock. And here now, we are here this evening for our evening service. We want to pick up from last week. We talked about uh, Joseph and his family, the problems that rises up in, uh, and the issues that rises up in the family and the home. Let's go to God in prayer first. Father, we thank you for our gathering this evening, for this time of worship. We thank you, Father, for this Lord's Day that we have so set aside that we can come and worship you in spirit and in truth. Now move mightily, dear God, upon uh, your people and help us, Lord, to show our appreciation for this day. And not only this day, but all days, living holy and righteous before you. But as we come now, Father, we pray that you endow us by your spirit that we will uh, readily be willingly to show forth righteousness in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, one of those righteousness I've just prayed about is forgiveness. Now, last week in Genesis, in Genesis chapter 45, we talked about Joseph. Now, remember, Joseph caused an uproar in his, his family, okay? We, we dealt with that two Sundays ago in that not only Joseph, but the father made Joseph a coat of different colors. And that caused some static, some problems, some jealousy and strife in the family. We talked about that, okay? And now on the top of that, Joseph was a dreamer. Joseph had the gift of dreams. And he told his dreams to his brother, and that made matters even worse in the case of the brothers. And then when the family was together in meal time, he talked to them about another dream that he had. And this shocked the father and the mother because the dream, this second dream, involved him being Lord even over his father and his mother. This didn't set too well with dad who just gave him a coat, you know, a couple of weeks ago. And um, whether or not he felt sorry for giving him that coat, but nevertheless, he was very fond of Joseph than all the other brothers. There was an attempt by um, Isaac to, uh, Jacob, excuse me, Jacob, to give Joseph the main inheritance, which is supposed to go to the older son, whether it was Judah or Simon or one of them, right? And that furiated the older brothers, the older sons. And so when they got together, they decided to do something to Joseph. They first dumped him into the pit, and then they wanted to um, uh, get rid of him permanently. Of course, Jacob didn't want his brothers to kill him because there is your flesh. But we find out even today that flesh and blood doesn't matter. Apparent, apparent, apparently for insurance sake or whatever the reason may be, depressed or whatever, seeks to uh, end the life of their child because they're going through some misery. Now, can you imagine that? But in any case, the brothers got together and they sold Joseph to Egypt, a, a, a caravan, a caravan was coming by and they was collecting stuff and so they collected joseph sold him for 30 pieces of silver same as jesus christ by judas is carrier the problem came up again when there became a phantom in the land joseph uh, J joseph father jacob sent the uh the 10 the 11 boys the 10 boys first to get some grain and they did but Jodas, Joseph noticed them, but they didn't know Joseph. And Joseph said, I'll give you the grain. Let me make the story short. I'll give you the grain. I'll give you whatever you want. But you need to make sure that all your brothers are present before me, before I did. So they went back home and told him that. And, and Jacob, um, he wrestled with that. He didn't want to give up his youngest son, Benjamin. So they took Benjamin anyway back to Egypt to see Joseph, who was in control and in charge of Egypt at that time. And uh, Joseph played along with their, you know, 
mishap and whatever they was doing, and they wanted some grain and food to take back to their father. So it came to pass that the family um, uh, told a lie again that their father was sick and that uh, that other brother was killed. You know, they really sold them. They didn't know that was Joseph they was telling the story to. So Joseph says, no, you, you're not telling me the truth. So he had all the guards leave the room and Joseph revealed himself to his brothers. That brought us from last sermon last week. And he says, is my father alive? They were stunned to find out that Joseph, second in command of Egypt, and they were standing before him and they was the ones that sold him into Egypt. And you can imagine how horrifying that situation was. And, the, and, and, and Joseph comforted them and says, don't be grieved because it wasn't you. This is uh, Genesis chapter 45. He said, uh, don't be angry with yourself uh, that you sold me for God did send me here before you. Joseph revealed to his brothers that God had a plan. And in that plan, Joseph was to suffer tremendously, hurtful, to be false accused of uh, fornication or adultery and or rape. Rape, let's put it that way, of rape. He was falsely accused of rape. He was put in prison because Pontiff's wife falsely accused him of rape. Joseph didn't do it, but she tried to push herself on Joseph and Joseph fled. But before he fled, as he fled, she grabbed his coat that he was wearing, his outer garment. And she proved that as a point that he was about to rape her because he was beginning to take his clothes off. Wow. So um, the story ended that Joseph spent some many years in prison, but God was with Joseph and blessed Joseph in those circumstances. So you see in the midst of trials and tribulation, in the midst of hospitalization, imprisonment, in the midst of discouragement and poverty and hurt and foolishness and homelessness, God is still prevailing. He is still there. He has never left you. He will never leave you. He never forsake you. The story of Joseph proved that point as the story of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and of course, mightily, the story of Job. So let's pursue it on. In Today, we want to look at, at forgiveness. Now, Joseph in chapter 25 was trying to get his brothers to let them know that I forgave you. Joseph learned a good lesson. It was harsh. It was hard. But he learned to trust in Jesus. He learned to trust in his God. Okay. Now, as we go to chapter uh, 50, let's turn our Bibles to chapter 50, dealing with forgiveness in the home, in the family, with your loved ones, family members, those who are close to you. We're going to use that here in Genesis chapter 50 with Matthew's chapter 18. All right, here we go. And Joseph returned to Egypt, he and his brother, and all that went up with him to bury his father. Now, what had happened in the course of many years, 17 plus years has passed since Joseph re uh, 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 revealed himself to his brethren who came to Egypt for grain. Okay, Now, at the same time, Jacob was getting sickly. The father in the home was getting sickly. All right? And he died. This is where we at. Now, Joseph returned to Egypt, he and his brethren. They had just buried the father. Okay? And when Joseph's brethren, listen, listen to what it says, Exodus, uh, Genesis 50 and verse 15. When Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will pre-adventure hate us. They see what is happening in many homes today. And that's the reason why many brothers are still not speaking to their brothers or sisters to their sisters or daughters to their mom, or daughters to their father or sons to their father or father to the son. It, 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 it channels because they have some innate 
emotional feeling that that brother or sister, mom or dad, niece or nephew, cousin or aunt, don't want nothing to do with them. Not knowing, because they didn't say anything, nobody's have enough courage to either pick up the phone, write a letter, call them, or whatever the case may be. Now, it's not so much as courage. It's the possibility of being let down, not answering the phone, or they answer the phone and say, what do you want? So why go through that again? Okay. So that may be the reason, but still someone may, needs to make the, the move. So here we have the father gone because Jacob kept the boys in line. As long as the father was alive, everything was peaches and cream. In some families, as long as the dad or the mom or the older brother or sister or who was at fault is around, things was okay. But as soon as dad died, the family got unraveled. They began to think that Joseph was still holding some feelings against them, which Joseph was not. So in, in the life of many families today, many, because they don't speak to each other, call each other, or have nothing to do with each other because of some silliness or whatever happened in the past. It is, it's silliness. It's, it's whether on their part or the other person's part. Forgiveness is not up the forefront. It is not part of their makeup at this point. They may need some time. They need to be, you know, strengthened by the Lord or events happen in their life that cause them to go back to their loved ones, to seek forgiveness, to re be reconciled to their dad, to their mom or whatever. I mean, it's the, it's the same thing about a year ago, the daughter left the home being pregnant because the father put them out. She had the child. Now, if, you know, before she, while she was pregnant, dad scorned her, said things out of anger, okay? And she decides to go live with her friend, whether it was a male or female, the, the child's father or a friend or stay in the dorm or whatever the case may be. She left home and and just left because she was hurt by the words of her father or the words of her mother or whatever the case may be. And the child is born, but the father now had months of thinking about what he had said. He missed his daughter. He, he yearns to reach out to her, but he don't know how to. So he needs an advocate. He needs someone to go in between because he feels funny retracting or being reconciled to the daughter he loves. Now, this is in many homes, in many situations, different from the pregnant teenage girl or from the son who doesn't want to work but stays in the home and the father is always riding his back about getting a job or vice versa, the mom is. There's plenty of situations that trust and many emotional feelings has been broken down and there's a thrust away from the home, from family ties. The Bible illustrates, see the Bible is indeed the family counseling book, okay? It is indeed the family counseling book. Because in the early church, the reason why we don't see all the instructions in the New Testament as well as the Old Testament, because the early church felt that the church was, is a family. Okay? Family members came together with the spiritual family and they praised God. They worshiped God. Anything that came up, the family dealt with it. Okay, the family dealt with it. Now I know that there are points in the, the the life of the family wherein there are secrets, there are mysteries, there are things done in the family and circumstances that uh, arises in the family. 
But the church, in the early church, they took an active part in relationship with the, the family. Anything that happened in the natural family, it affected the spiritual family, the church. And so that's why the scriptures push out husband love your wives, wives submit yourselves, children obey your parents, and this and that, and it speaks of marriage, it speaks of uh, separation, divorce, singlehood, singleness, uh, not getting married, uh, infer infertility, in, in other words, a family uh, who can't, a mom or dad who can't have children, as the Bible speaks of that, the Bible speaks of divorce, the Bible speaks of abortion, the Bible speaks of homosexuality, the Bible speaks of transgender, all these issues that in that's in the family and causes some problems or causes of uproar or causes whatever, the Bible speaks of that as a family issues. Okay. And that's where we at right now with a family issue that the brothers, now whether or not Benjamin, his younger brother felt that way, the scripture doesn't say that, but at least the older boys felt that when their father died, Joseph is going to remember the bad stuff. See, in psychology and in counseling, the reason why many brothers and sisters that you and I may have may not have a family, may not have children, may not have whatever relationship because of what has stunned them during their life within their family. And so therefore they say, I'm not gonna have children. I'm not gonna get married. I'm not gonna uh, have a girlfriend. I'm not gonna get a boyfriend. I'm just gonna stick with my career. I'm just gonna stay single. And, and that's their prerogative. But it's not a prerogative when it's bent on a harsh decision made because of the way your mom and dad didn't have a good marriage so you say, well, what's the point of getting married? Because if I do get married, I might have a marriage like my mom and dad, and I don't want to end up like them. That's possible. It's very possible. But to see, in any given situation, it is up to you as an individual to make your marriage, your relationship with your children, with your children's father, and et cetera, with the rest of the family high, on a high note. It doesn't have to be the way you was brought up. Maybe you was brought up and you wasn't given toys. And so you say, well, I'm not gonna have children because I don't want that stigma in me that I might feel that I might not give toys to my children. No, that's that's what happened in your child life. It doesn't necessarily have to happen in your own adult life. You can change that. You can make up your mind and say, well, you know, I'm gonna make my family marriage uh, uh, a matter or works, my marriage, my relationship that you're going through and everything like that. Right? So, but the boys here had a blow in their mind, had a thing, a stigma in their minds, feeling that Joseph wasn't forgiving. Joseph had something against them and he was going to use it. And that's why I said, here, Joseph will pre-adventure hate us and will certainly require us all the evil which he did unto him. Now, now that dad is gone, Joseph is going to use his power and use his influence or his money to get back at us. It's just like all of a sudden mom died or dad died and in your family, your brother who is the oldest is the CEO or owns a company or whatever and the family is is run, is, is supported by that company. So now that the parents are gone, the CEO, who is your brother, is going to say, hmm, I ain't, now, I ain't got to support them. Y'all go out and get your own job. Leave me alone. See, while the parents was alive, everything was okay. And in some occasions, that might happen. But it wasn't in the case of Joseph, because notice what Joseph said. And see, they sent the message to Joseph saying the father did command before he died. Now, whether or not that was true or not, they may be still lying. I don't know. But this is what in the note that they sent to Joseph. Remember our father, before he died, says, so shall you say to Joseph, forgive. See, 
They're saying Jacob left a will or he left a note to give to Joseph at his death, saying, Joseph, I want you to forgive your brothers, even though that they treated you bad and everything. Don't do them no harm. Actually, there was no note. There was no note. And Joseph was aware of that. He didn't care the least because he has forgiven his brothers, his brothers. Okay. Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren, their sins, for they did evil. And now we pray that uh, you forgive their trespass uh, of the servants of the God of the Father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. See, they that see the letter was addressed to Joseph in uh uh, a messenger came and spoke the, the letter and it, it grieved Joseph that his own brothers would think that he will retaliate for what they've done. Now, in given the situation today, some brothers and sisters would do that. And it's been proven. We've seen it. We see it on you know the news and in and, and, and courts in many sessions, how that is a known fact. You take your brother or sister, even your own mother to court after dad has died, after things get, you know, and you fight over the will, over the money. And this is the situation here, all right? And, and his brothers also went and fell down before his face, verse 18, and said, behold, we are your servants. We, we, we want to be your slaves. We know we've done wrong. You know, um, these brethren, they really wanted to be forgiven by Joseph. They needed help. Like I emphasized the pregnant girl who had the child and she came back and showed her father the handsome son. He realized that now he's a grandfather and words cannot be expressed how he felt. He felt horrible in now sending his daughter away like that and not supporting her in that hour of her need. He wasn't showing compassion and love as a father should. He scorned his son, he scorned his wife. He, you know, he's, you know, that type of man or that type of mother or wife or husband, son or daughter. Even there's bickery between brothers and brothers, sister and sister, sister, brother, brother, sister. And it goes on for years and years and years and years. But finally, when someone die or sickness prevail, or there's a get together, the family outing, or there's a family get together, you know, these things, and they come together by some ironic means, they're brought back into a relationship, which is good. So, these brothers came and they fell before Joseph. Joseph said, fear not. Am for I am I in the place of God. See, Joseph was telling his brothers that I realized that you did me wrong. I realized that you hurt me in the past. You thought you was doing evil, but God allowed it. I know now. See, now maybe... In the beginning, when you had your fight or when you had your argument with your father or your mom and you separated and you went away to Los Angeles, Pennsylvania or whatever, and you haven't seen or called your mother, your father, your sister or brother because of the situation for a long time. But now somehow Providence brought y'all back together. All right. Maybe this virus, you picked up the phone and said, Dad, you all right? Okay, I just called to see if you are all right, click. <laughs> okay, she, but then the father thinking, you know, let me call. Let me call my daughter back. Let me call her back. So he gets on the phone and he calls and say, uh, daughter, you know, I thank you for calling. And, you know, why don't we just get together and have lunch or so we can talk and, 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 and share and, you know, whatever. They agree. So this is happening in many homes and many relationships and families, even today. Right? Fathers leaving their child to the mother and haven't seen them in years and vice versa. The mother put up their children for adoption, but now all of a sudden she's burdened, she's sad, 
and she wants to find out who her child is living with. She wants, you know, visitation and whatever. But yet the child who's an adopted family now, been there for about, you know, eight years, 10 years, comfortable, going okay, going to school and whatever. Haven't forgotten mom, but it's in the back of her mind or his mind. But all of a sudden, her adopted parents pull the child aside and say, you know what, we have a surprise for you. Um, we want, just want to prepare you that your real mom, your real dad wants to see you. The child who is nine years old, 12 years old, maybe 15, maybe 22, whatever the case may be, still living with their parents, okay. Let's put it that way. Um, they brush it off and say, well, I don't, I don't wanna see them. So the adopted mom says, uh, and the dad says, you know what, you, you ought to see them. You know, they is your mom, they brought you into the world. So they persuaded the daughter, the son, to see their parent. You know, I mean, they, they invite them to dinner or they, they go out and whatever the case may be. So this is, this is real life situations. Right? This is the same thing with Joseph. When they brought, brought the message to Joseph, Joseph cried because he felt it was unbelievable that his brothers would think that he would do them harm. In a given situation in some families, it may be true. This is the reason why we pay homage and, and respect and honor to our parents while they're still alive and our sisters and brothers while they're still alive because tragedy can any moment take them away from us and you only have one father. You only got one mother. That, that adopted mother is not gonna take the place of your real mother. I mean, you may go live with your stepmother, your stepfather, your adopted mother or in foster care and, 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 and everything like that. That mom that brought you into the world, that nursed you for a couple of months until you was taken away for whatever reasons, or you was you left the home at 12 years old, 14 years old, or even nine because you was pregnant and went to Los Angeles to live with a friend or whatever the case may be. You would always remember your birth mom. And that that hurt it, Joseph, because the scripture says he wept. But then he wiped away his tears and said, fear not, am I in the place of God? So what, what, is, what is happening here? And somewhat David, I mean, excuse me, the, the brothers felt that, they, that Joseph was going to show revenge, retaliation for what they did to him. And again, I say, and I repeat, in some situations, Vengeance and retaliation can happen, All right? And uh, that's where we get. That's where we come to Matthew chapter eighteen. But for right now, Joseph says, "I am I in the place of God?" The Scripture says, "Vengeance is the Lord." All right. D D Joseph went on and says, "But as for you, you thought evil against me." See, that was a lesson that Joseph had to learn. Not all of us can learn that, but Joseph learned that while he was in prison and while he was under Pontifus and being cared for. And then he became the second in charge, even over his master Pontifus and his wife. Now, Joseph could have retaliated against Pontifus' wife. Oh yeah, see, remember earlier, she lied that Joseph raped her fondled with her, sexually abused her, and she lied. Joseph with second command power now could have reached out and say, Pontifa, I want your wife put in jail. He had the right, he had the power to do that, but he didn't do that. That was the furthest thing from Joseph's mind. Just like right now, he felt that's the furthest thing from my mind to retaliate and seek revenge or my brothers and sisters, and you that have brothers and sisters, stop seeking revenge and retaliation for what they did to you 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Regroup, reconcile, 
reconcile and forgive and nourish each other because there will come a time when one of you will be taken away from each other in death. Joseph says, no, I, I don't, I, don't worry about that. Come together. I will nourish you, your children, and comfort you. Now, let's go to Matthew chapter 28. Remember that from Genesis, okay, of Joseph. Now, in Matthew chapter 28, let us define the word forgiveness. It is a very difficult thing to do. It is. It's, it's, it's lingering. It's very hard to do because when someone does you wrong, it's, it, it crushes you. It hurts you. Whether it's the husband, the wife, the children who are your intermediate family. It does more damage than a niece or a nephew or a cousin or even an uncle or aunt. They do cause havoc. They can cause havoc or do and crush you, but not so severely like a husband, a wife, a son or a daughter, okay? A dad, a mom, a sister or a brother. Listen to what uh, Peter, when Peter approached the Lord, is in Matthew chapter 18. Here we go in um, verses, let's go to verse uh, 15, all right? Well, let's go down to 21. Okay, that's when Peter came. But it, uh, verses 15 through 20 is very interesting too. But let's go to verse 21. Let's look at, then came Peter unto the master, that's Jesus, and said, Lord, how often shall my brother, my sister, my mom, my dad, who are closer to me. See, you notice the words that he's using. He didn't say a friend. He didn't say a distant relative, a neighbor. Okay. He said a brother. He says, how often shall my brother, my brother, my sister, right, sin against me, do me wrong? Okay. Something they have done wrong to you that broke your relationship that caused you not to speak to them anymore or have nothing to do with them anymore not to call them to write to them to speak of them peter says how often shall my brother sin against me and i forgive him see this is one someone closer to you that they did you wrong once. You overlooked it. They did you wrong twice. You start dwelling on it. Then the third time, you know, hey, look, sis, no, uh-uh, that's it. Or oh, bro, you know, you, 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 you really messed up this time. This is the situation Peter is looking at. Peter says, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Seven times. See, Peter, as many of us, feel as though that three, four, five, six, seven, that's enough. Uh -uh. And Jesus said to Peter, I say not unto you until seven times, but until 70 times seven. Now, this is not a multiplication thing. Uh, he was driving home a point here, all right? And the Lord is teaching some very profound um, statement here when he says 70 times seven, because we are used to keeping scores on people. We are so used to retaliating and seeking revenge. And to some of us, revenge is sweet. It's, it's, it's all right, it's nourishing. It makes us happy. But Jesus says, no, I don't want you to do that. Mm -hmm. 
It is a need for us to regain the relationship and fellowship with our brothers and sisters and mom and dad, who is the close immediate inner circle of our lives. And Jesus sought to use this time to tell Peter, no, beyond seven times, Peter, by the grace of God, which I will give you, you're able to forgive. We forget that. We rely on our human instinct and our flesh, which rouses us up to anger and rebellion and revenge and retaliation instead of the grace of God. This is why Peter, uh, uh, Paul in Ephesians, in Ephesians, let me turn to it, so I don't want to misquote it. He says in Ephesians chapter four, let all bitterness and anger and glamour be put away from among you. Because it is possible while you still love your brothers to the point and your sister and your mom and dad to show bitterness and anger towards them. All right? There's a, a heated anger, there's a malice anger, and then there's a wicked and evil anger. The believer in Christ shows the first symptoms, which is an anger of bitterness. It's never taken to the point, it's never, let me repeat, it's never taken to the point of the second and third stage because that disqualifies you as a true believer, like we preached this morning about love. But sometimes we like to keep score. We like to revenge or retaliate, which is in the realm of bitterness. And it happened to Peter because Peter wouldn't have never brought it up. So he says, Lord, how often should I forgive my brother? Till seven times, Jesus says, I say unto you, 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven. And then he gives a parable. Listen to this parable he gives. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a certain king, a wealthy guy, a wealthy merchant, which would give a, take account of his servants. See, he had people working under him who were wealthy also, he made them wealthy. And when he begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which had owed him 10,000 talents. Let's just say $10,000. For much as he had not to pay his Lord, commanded him to be sold and his wife and everything that he had. He began to plead with his, his master. I will do anything to pay you back that $10,000. See, we fall out over $5, $20, $1,000 because our brother and sister owe us or our loved one and we, we gave them a loan, we helped them with this and that. I mean, and we rip, our relationships rip because of money, finance, a, a promise or whatever the case may be, a pledge. And this is the case here in this parable. The man fell on his knees and worshiped him saying, Lord, I have patience with me. Verse 26, I will pay you. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion. That's how we should be. And loosed him, see, loosed him and forgave him the debt. This is in Ephesians 4.30. Even forgive ye one another, even as Christ for God's sake has forgiven you. See, we, we forget that. We forget all what we did in our past life and all what we will do until the second coming of Christ or till death takes us away. Christ has forgiven us of all of our sins, past, present, and future. Ephesians 4.30 says, even as God forgave you because of Christ, forgive ye one another. We struggle with that. We struggle that with our sister, with our brother, with our mom and dad, the inner circle. We struggle with that with our niece, our nephews, with our, grand, with our grandchildren or with our uncles and aunts and in-laws, the outer circle. 
we struggle with that with that circle, that third wave, which is our neighbors and those we work with and those in the community. So whether it's the third circle, whether it's the second circle, or whether it's the first circle, the scripture says, forgive ye one another. So the servant, the king, forgave his servant. In verse 28, 29, and 30, that same servant who was just forgiven and had compassion showed to him, the same thing happened to him in that people owe him money. See, what comes around, you know, goes around, comes around. Okay, it, it, here it is. That same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owe him a money, a lesser money. He laid hands on him and took him and by the throat and saying, pay me what you owe. Give me what you owe. <laughs> the servant fell down just like he did before his master and said, I owe you. I know I owe you, but, you know, please forgive me. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. I'm going to cast you into the prison. I'm going to treat you bad. I'm going to ignore you. I don't want nothing to do you. I don't want to call you no more. Don't you call me. I don't want nothing. If you get in debt, if you get, I don't care what happened to you, leave me alone. That's what some of us would do. So the brother and sister leaves the presence of the brother and sister, the father, the mother, and they haven't spoken in years. Now, word got back to the servant's CEO who moments earlier had forgiven him. So he calls that servant back to his attention. And he says, why did you treat your mom and dad, your brother and sister, like that when you came to me with a repentant heart and you came to me with all your sorrow and grief and asked for salvation? I had compassion on you and I forgave you of all your sin, your past, your present, and your future. I forgave you. I, I just let it go. I released you from that. Why would you not do that to your dad after he just told you that he was sorry for yelling at you, cursing and treating you a year ago because you told him you was pregnant and he kicked you out of the house or your son or your, your brother to brother, sister to sister. See, this is that illustration here in the latter part of chapter 18. You know what I'm going to do to you? Just as you treated the servant under you, I'm going to recompense, recompense what you deserved. See, that's why we face now, even as Christians, the anguish, the pain, maybe sickness and conditions in our lives because we haven't forgiven others. Remember the Lord's prayer? He says, whosoever eat of this bread and drink of this cup unworthily. And if you eat it and drink unworthily, you're going to be physically disciplined by God. You're going to be mentally disciplined by God. You're going to be spiritually disciplined by God through death. Because God is going to chasten you. Why do we think that we as Christians can get away with it when God says, I have forgiven you. What is it, pride or ego or you've been hurt, you've been crushed? Sure, many of us has been crushed. Our pride and ego has been bored to the limit and especially towards a family member. How often shall we forgive our brothers or sisters, our mom and dad, when they do something wrong, seven times, Jesus said no. Because the spirit of grace, the spirit of God is now resting in us. We are capable of pulling mom and dad and grandparents aside, our brothers and sisters aside and say, you know what? It's okay. I understand that. Don't worry about it. I'm releasing you. I'm not holding that against you. Let's talk. Let's go out together. Let's do things. Let's go back before the time that we split up. 
in which you did me wrong or I did you wrong. Let's restore our fellowship back again. This is the lesson Joseph was trying to teach his brethren. And as any good story, and they live forever, and they live happy forever after. <laughs> That's how some stories goes on. But unfortunately, some will still walk away with a bitter heart. Some will still not speak to their father or their mother or their sister or brother. Even after the knowledge that God has forgiven you of your sins. Don't you know you will be disciplined for that? Okay. It's called judicial. It's called judicial forgiveness. It is when God forgives you, but because you sought not to forgive others, he steps in and say, you know, you, you need to learn a lesson. And whatever means of chastisement God is going to seek because he loves you and you are his child. He's not going to let you get away with just not being reconciled with your brother or sister, whether in church or in your own family, you will be disciplined by God, chastened of the Lord. And whom the Lord loveth, he chases and scourges every son whom he has received. So let us now wipe our hands. Let us forgive and move on because in closing, not forgiving and, 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 and holding a grudge against a aunt, a uncle, a mother, a father, a sister, a brother, or a classmate, or anyone in particular, it's only going to bring you down. That person and you having a non-forgiving spirit, an unforgiving spirit, in actuality, in, in counseling and psychology, it is taught that they are still, they are controlling you. Yes, they are, because every time the name is mentioned, or every time somebody says something, you reflect on what had happened in the past. That's a controlling factor. And it's going to bring you down. And bitterness, hostility, and envy, and, 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 and uh, revenge, and all that is going to sip its way into your life with bitterness. But again, in Ephesians 4, Paul says, let all bitterness... Let all anger, glamour, evil speaking put, be put away from among you. Be not drunk with wine, Ephesians 5, 18, but be filled with the Spirit. See, the filling of the Spirit comes into our life and he enables us to forgive. A, 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 a power that in our own in our own lives we are not able to do but through christ i can do all things through christ which strengthens me that's the word of god philippians so no matter what the situation between your mom your dad your sister your brother your aunt your uncle a relative near or far your grandchildren, your nieces and nephews, in-laws, neighbors, outer neighbors, supervisors, employees. The scripture says, forgive. The scripture says, vengeance is the Lord. And you know one thing? It may not be God's will to take vengeance on them, but you want it. You want to set the record right. You want to retaliate. And this is wrong. And God is not going to bless as long as you hover that and have that in your heart, in your mind, in your being, to get back at your brother, sister, mom, and dad. While they're trying to reach out to you and do all they can to seek forgiveness. And then it may not even be a time that they will do it. You as a Christian need to take that step and intervene back into their lives. That's the Christian thing to do, which Peter was instructed by Jesus to do. And Jesus gave that parable. Joseph tells us to do it. Daniel, 
he forgave those guys that caused him to be locked up in the lion den. But the king didn't. The king threw him into the lion's den, right? And their family. Job. Job didn't retaliate because the three friends, the four guys came and sat with him and accused him of this and that. And that's what the whole rest of the book of Job is based on. But Job forgave his friends. And eventually, and God forgave them, but they had to do a sacrifice because they also falsely accused Job. But Job didn't retaliate. Retaliation has no place. Revenge has no place in the life of the believer. The child of God must seek God's favor, must seek God's will. We want to thank the Lord as we bow in prayer. It is a difficult thing to do. It's a challenging thing to do. And it's very hard to do. And that's why we go to the Lord in these issues in our lives that we do not have the power to do. We are, we, we are dependent upon the Lord to strengthen us in these occasions when, when, wherein we don't have the strength to do it. So whether your son, your brother, your daughter, your sister, your mom, your dad, your foster mom, your foster dad, your adopted mom, your adopted dad, your adopted mother, your aunt, your uncle, your niece, your nephews, your in-laws, your relatives, your friends, and people afar off, we can go to God and he will give us the grace. His grace is sufficient to override all that we have against another person because of the wrong that they did us. And two to one, the things that they really done is something that really has been in the past. Some of it may have been serious. Some of it may have been foolish. Some of it may be because of ignorance or because of jealousy or whatever the case may be. The problem exists. You can get rid of that problem, not through revenge and retaliation, ignoring them, downgrading them, talking about them, backbiting about them, but simply going to God in prayer. Asking the Lord to give you grace and strength to forgive. Go to them before you go to God. See, we do things backwards. We say, Father, forgive me for having ill feeling against my brother, my mom. When God is saying, well, you need to go to them first. And that's scripture. First, go to them first. There's not a full release by the Lord God unless you first go to them first, then come to the Father. You can continue to go and have prayer in church and do your thing. But if you have not settled that with mom and dad, sister and brother, your aunt and uncle, nieces and nephews, and your relatives in general, then you're not going to receive a full blessing from God. Oh, you may survive. You may receive common blessings just like an unsaved person does. But the fullness of the spiritual blessings as Paul and Peter is saying, awaits you when you yield totally to God. Sure, you're going to fail just like I'm going to fail God many times, and we're not perfect. But when those occasions come, we seek forgiveness. We seek restitutions. We seek reconciliation quickly before Jesus, by means of the Heavenly Father, chastens us. Let's look to the Lord and pray. Father, we come right now. We thank you, Father, for allowing us to discover the power and the reality of authentic Christian forgiveness. So stated in your word. Throughout the scriptures, you have planted individuals in their lives, their stories, to pave a way to let us know that we can forgive. Simon, even though he had a, relation, a sexual relationship 
with his sister who posed as a prostitute in the book of Genesis. But when he found out, he forgave his sister and then asked the Lord to forgive. Job, Daniel, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, many, even in the New Testament. Father, we pray that we will run to the hills. We will lift up our eyes unto the hills which cometh our help. Help us and give us your grace and your strength to go to that loved one and somehow make restitution, make re reconciliation for the wrong that we have done to them. We thank you, Father. Help us to put away bitterness, envy, strife, and jealousy. Strengthen us and cleanse us. Thank you, Father. Blessed is thy name, O God, who heals, who comforts. We thank you, Father. That relationship will be bonding between elder to elder, church to church, family members and family members, relatives, friends, associates, neighbors. May it so work right now, Father. And we thank you for it. Blessed is thy name, O God, and we praise you forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. We thank the Lord for the scriptures teaching us about the power and the total reality of forgiveness. Even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you of your trespasses and sins, forgive you one another. Go to God and we praise God and thank God. May God bless you and may you have a blessed coming week. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen.